All right, so good afternoon, everybody, um, and thanks for joining another edition of the Grapevine Executive Chat. My name is Ed Gilmore, and today's episode is being recorded on November 18th, 2020. In a few moments, we'll be talking to Mobivity Holding CEO and Executive Chairman Dennis Becker. Mobivity recently presented to the Little Grapevine community, but we're excited to have Dennis today for more of a fireside chat format. For anyone new, Mobivity trades on the OTC under the ticker symbol MFON. Also, Mobivity currently has a market cap of about 67.1 million, and as of today, November 18th, closed at $1.30 per share. As far as business, Mobivity develops and operates a proprietary platform that helps partner conduct data-driven marketing campaigns, and the company also works closely with point-of-sale systems and restaurants to create dynamic offers. If you've ever been to a quick service restaurant and gotten an offer or promotion at the top of your receipt, there's a good chance that that may have been powered by Mobivity. But uh, here to tell us much more about that and answer some questions is Dennis Becker. Dennis, welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. Then also joining today on the call is Geo Investing co-founder and managing partner, Maj Swaydan. Uh, Maj is a longtime microcap investor and is, and is an expert in researching and analyzing microcap companies. Maj shares his research and trade ideas with subscribers at geoinvesting.com and I'd encourage everybody to check that out. Maj, good to have you and good to speak to you again. Hey, thanks, Ed, and uh, back for the introduction, and, and nice to see you again, Dennis. I'm excited to be here. So, um, so Maj, next week is uh, Thanksgiving here in the U.S., and since we're all kind of thinking about food, I can't think of a better, better company or, or better CEO to have uh, with us this week. But before we get into the questions, uh, how long have you been tracking Mobivity, and what kind of drew you to the story initially? Yeah, I think it's maybe um, maybe two and a half years now, and uh, I started actually following the company. And um, you know, in the very beginning, it was just kind of like a cursory glance. I had, I had talked to Dennis to get in the background of what's going on. Um, I had talked to um, Brett Moss, who actually introduced me to uh, Dennis. To, I thought I should um, maybe start watching the company. And you know, we're always looking, and Brett knows this, and we're always looking for companies um, at Geo that have maybe recurring revenue type of models or Predictable, predictable models. You know, we transitioned a lot of our, uh, our research in recent years of software models that um, are pretty appealing, where we think a company can attain potentially high gross margins and you know re really um, drive revenue grow, uh, revenue point where eventually profits become um, uh, consistent. And when I when I first met um, Dennis, uh, there were some things I, we needed him to hit on before we really started really getting excited about the company. Um, we wanted to see. Um, the company get closer to um, profitability, maybe see their gross margins expand. And um, they really started uh, hitting on that recently. So um, really, we reconnected with Dennis again not too long ago and to kind of get an update in the story. And um, really um, it's been good to see that he's kind of hit on the things that we talked about a couple of years ago. Gross margin, I think Dennis around 70% now is the last quarter. You hit profitability, uh, which is nice. And um, I think the story right now is really timely in terms of what's going on in this um, in this world right now with the coronavirus. And even without that, you had a great story, I think, in terms of what you were trying to do with your customer engagement solutions. Um, but it's even more um, relevant today. So um, that's kind of the, brings, brings us up to date here, Ed, and why we're following the company. And by the way, I do own stock in the company. I should disclose that. And um, as do, and um, I think that's important to, for people to know. Yeah, good. Thanks for that, Maj. And, and as you were talking, we had our, our disclosures on, on the screen there. And um, I'm also a shareholder in Mobivity too, and it's important to disclose that as well. Um, so Maj, thanks for that. And just as a, a quick reminder, if anybody didn't see the last um, call we did with Dennis, there's a there's a full presentation on the company that's available at littlegrapevine.com. I would encourage you to go check that out. Um, there's, there's even more questions and some additional content at the end of that that are really insightful. And, and we hope you take the time to look at that. Um, and then today, as far as the format, we will be asking Dennis uh, questions. And if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat feature in, in Zoom. Um, type those in. We'll see those and make sure to ask them uh, as we go through the interview. And then also, uh, this is being recorded on uh, November 18th. So anyone that's listening after, if you have any questions that we may have missed or something that you'd like to ask Dennis, please feel free to submit those questions to questions at littlegrapevine.com or hit us on Twitter at Hey Grapevine, and we'll make sure to get those questions to Dennis and, and work the answers into a, a future interview. 
So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining. And Dennis, again, it's, it's good to have you. appreciate you taking the time today. And, and Maj, I'll turn it back over to you for the, the first question. Yeah. Hey, OK, great. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, and Dennis, you know, look, we, we, have, we have many more of these we can do to answer many questions. So um, if we don't touch upon something today, we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get to it again. But I really want this to be about, um, you know, starting a, maybe let um, investors understand who you are, um, how, you, how you arrived at Mobivity what you were doing before you reached, uh, uh, arrived at the company, um, a little your vision and what, what, what gives you, what makes you qualified to run this company and make it you know, as, as you grow. Um, that's really a big part of our research at Geo Investing um, is really betting on the jockey. And um, we like to know why you think you're that person and maybe, maybe go through some challenges you've gone through and how you met them um, before and within um, your time at Mobility. Mobility. No, absolutely. And, and I, I appreciate that. I think that's a, a good introduction to my, you know, for myself and, and for the company. So I'm the founder of Mobivity um, and I've been a lifelong technologist. I started you know, writing code at a very young age. I'm the, uh, I, I've invented a number of patents. Uh, so my passion has always been technology. And I think what's been exciting about Mobivity and this journey, I, you know, I, I'm, um, started my entrepreneurial uh, experience in the mid nineties. I was studying computer science in college. I expected to end up as a, you know, software developer. I was already writing software in high school. And um, like a lot of us in the mid nineties, uh, you know, I remember using, I remember getting in arguments with, with one of, with my boss when I was 18 years old about why we needed to get off CompuServe and that there's this thing called the internet. Um, so in the mid nineties, you know, look, I mean, I, I left, uh, a company I worked at during college. Uh, I got a number of, uh, consulting arrangements where I was developing software. I was writing a cognitive, uh, analysis engine for dream research for a prominent dream researcher. Uh, I, I also had a client who was, uh, I was writing a project control software management system for a general contractor. And. So that really, you know, at, at the time, you know, I was building software and that was my passion. And at, at the same time, you know, I had been participating in what was the early innings of the internet. And um, very quickly, obviously, you know, the internet became a business and it became an entrepreneurial endeavor and it swept up a bunch of us software engineers into pursuing entrepreneurial pursuits um, related to, to opportunities and in, in taking things to, you know, the quote unquote internet. And I had a client who's actually still a shareholder um, and has been investing in Mobivity ever since, um, who started my first company I, I partnered with. And um, so I had a couple of, couple of swings at the bat early on, uh, a couple of ideas. One was a, a project, or a, I'm sorry, an employee management system. It is very analogous to the instant messaging solutions we use today, like um, you know, Google Chat or Slack, you know, things like that. Late 90s, early 2000s, our customers were NASA. Uh, the city of Oceanside, um, prophetically, the Chandler Police Department, which is now Chandler, Arizona, which is in Phoenix, which is where uh, Phoenix, uh, Mobivity is headquartered now, uh, was a customer. So we had municipalities. And I, you know, I had a couple bites at the Apple entrepreneurially uh, at the end of the 90s, kind of first part of the 2000s, doing some small software startups. I'm proud to say that those investors are also investors in Mobivity. So they've kind of followed the entrepreneurial vision all along. We, we kicked off Mobivity in um, you know, 2007, 2008, because we really saw what was happening with, with mobile. We really saw that you know, for adoption of the internet and, and digital lifestyle to become as per pervasive as, it, as it's become is it, you know, really was about the mobile platform. And um, I remember in the early innings of Mobivity talking about text messaging and having to explain how, um, yeah, no, that's something teen more than teenagers are going to do. And, um, you know, here we are today. Uh, and I, I think that it's, it's almost become kind of a no brainer. Um, people spend the majority of their digital lifestyle on the mobile phone. So early on in Mobivity's uh, genesis, uh, what I was very, I personally was very successful at doing with the company was, you know, I went out and forged relationships with the NFL. I, um, I, I brokered a deal with the NBA and Turner Broadcasting at the time that Turner Digital took over all digital endeavors from the NBA, which turned into a relationship with CNN. So, 
you know, in, in the first half of our lifespan, you would have seen Mobivity as the, you know, if you got an NFL.com fantasy football alert that was powered, you know, over text message that was powered by Mobivity. If you voted for MVP at the NBA finals, that was Mobivity. If you text, if you texted questions into Anderson Cooper 360, uh, you know, for the Lexus, you know, question of the night, that was Mobivity. And uh, we, we knew we were in the ballpark. And uh, in terms of the, the fact that mobile was going to be a big, uh, a big part of digital lifestyle. Um, at the time, however, you know, these, these high profile entertainment and sports projects, as, as I'll call them, didn't create the subscription recurring revenue model that, you know, we've, we've really built today. Um, you know, there's only one Super Bowl per year, you know, there's only 30 NFL teams or, or, you know, something like that. So, uh, limited addressable market, high profile, uh, but but just again, short term, non recurring, and part of the uh, of, our, of us taking the company public, and that was really where, in two thousand nine, two thousand ten, um, you know, I'd seen the opportunity to bring some other text messaging companies under the Mobivity umbrella, and 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 bring in customers. So, um, you know, look, I've seen the movie at Mobivity from day one. I've, I've guided the vision from high profile uh, to much more, I think, financially lucrative business model that we're, we're at today. Um, and, you know, even that was still a little bit early, but to, to kind of take us to, to present day events, I think that everyone's appreciating uh, the vision and, and the pivot that we took in 2014, 2015, which was, you know, look, brick and mortar business dwarfs e-commerce. You know, people can buy books and other things online and at Amazon, but it, you know, that, that e-commerce is still only 20 to 30% of our economy. You know, you can't eat a sandwich online, you can't get your oil changed online, you know, those types of things. And so when we saw the potential for addressable market in 2014, 2015, um, and it took a lot, it took a lot to divorce ourselves from uh, you know, the uh, kind of the, the, the fame of having the NFL and sports teams and all these highly notable types of entertainment customers and, and a transition to um, more of the everyday life brands, all, even though those brands are, are just as important and, and probably in many cases, even more recognizable like Subway and Chick-fil-A and others. Um, you know, we, we really steered the business towards what could become a highly lucrative subscription-based revenue model. And um, so for myself, you know, back to kind of your original question, I think that, um, you know, I've had the, um, the, the privilege of, of, of seeing the full movie at Mobivity. Um, but I've been, I've, been at the, I've been at the tip of the spear. I've, I've worked with all of our leading brands. Uh, I've forged all of those deals. And um, I think that what that's done is kind of set us up to where we are today, you know, with partnerships with Google, Pepsi, major customers like Subway, you know, we just announced a major convenience store brand this week and we're, we're looking forward to revealing who that brand is uh, as soon as we get their program launched. Um, so it's really about, you know, Mobivity's at a level of product quality, scalability and value delivery um, that, you know, I've had the, the, the privilege of, of being a part of from day one. You know, and I, I, I was going to talk about this later, but this new um, customer you just landed, actually, that you haven't disclosed yet, that's a pretty big deal for you guys because, I mean, um, I think a lot of, uh, even the question that I had for you originally when we first talked was, you, know, you have, um, you know, a big customer, you know, in, in Subway, um, and what do you do to diversify that, right? And, and I, this, this, what, this news, is, I'm assuming, is going to be a big step towards that, right? And um, getting some diversification in your in your revenue. Yeah, and it's a very rational um, move too, just in the sense that you know if you study up on the quick serve restaurant space, and, and that's actually been the the part of the food industry that's done pretty well uh, in this pandemic um, because it brings value, brings economic um, opportunities, uh, in just in the sense that it's it's less expensive, more affordable food. It's also, it, it, it's not going to be in-store dining and the full experience that people want, but at the same time, it still gives them the instant gratification. Um, I've got three young kids, so you want to feed those guys. 
and you want to do it quick and uh, you don't want to cook, uh, you know, fast food's kind of the only way you do it. Um, but the convenience store space is, is a, you know, a quick second. It's actually the fastest growing quick serve food segment in the quick serve industry. And when you think about what's kind of going on is, is you, you know, the, the consumer is starting to really rely on a, an increasing number of, of purchases being done online and through delivery. And, and so that's creating this, this gap, right? So you can buy more and more through Amazon and Walmart and digital services, and you can buy, um, you know, if you need that, if you need milk and you need something impulsively, it's just, a, you know, the, the location footprint and the proximity of convenience stores serves that need a lot more effectively. And so we think that that's a space that's going to thrive in the post pandemic, you know, quote unquote, new normal. So it's a really exciting addressable market for us. And it's one that's not a leap too, because a lot of the things that work that we've learned after watching billions and billions of transactions uh, through all these brands in the quick serve space, you know, that data and that information is very relevant in moving the needle for convenience as well. So I want to get into, um, I really want to concentrate um, in a second of understanding why you're better than your competition. I think that's really important because there's some um, things there that we need to discuss. But before we get into that, what's, 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 give me, just everybody's listening, give us, I mean, a financial uh, perspective of where you are right now, size of the company, um, your revenues, and uh, some of the growth that's occurred this um, in the last nine months for you. And then we'll get into some of that stuff. Yeah, no, we're, we're, look, we're, um, we just reported a third quarter that was profitable. Um, we've reported a, a first nine month period that's uh, exceeding, you know, the, the, the same um, period last year by a significant amount. We, we went into the year posting a record first quarter and, you know, we felt that, look, you know, what the way that we've described it is, you know, brick and mortar is ultimately going to adopt all of the, the data driven and the digital approaches that have made e-commerce so effective and so efficient. Um, it's been an evolutionary process, one that we felt was organically moving to an inflection point at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. And that's why we had a, a real great first quarter. Uh, you know, the pandemics really just transitioned us into kind of extinction level event. And if you look around, even customers that, that Mobivity has like, you know, Sonic, which is owned by Inspire and Inspire just announced that now they're buying Duncan. So now they're going to own Duncan, Arby's, Sonic. Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings and Jimmy John's, and they're part of the Rourke Empire that also owns, um, you know, Cinnabon, Carl's Jr., Auntie Anne's, so just a slew of brands. And um, so, you know, we already felt like as we were coming into this year, you know, we were, you know, Sonic was acquired by Inspire a year, a year prior, and we, we felt like there was opportunity to grow into their, their portfolio brands, and, and we always, already felt the momentum. Uh, and not that I ever asked for a pandemic to throw into our sales, but, um, you know, I think that that when you look around the industry, um, you know, our, our financial performance this year, which is, you know, we're going to be up at least 30 percent top line, uh, our cash burns down, you know, high double digit percentage points. You know, we, we had a profitable third quarter. Our gross margins are up to 70 percent now. So, you know, all of the things that we were kind of saying were going to come. Um, you know, once, once the, the boulder started rolling down the hill, um, it had started to transpire earlier this year. And I think that with, with the pandemic, it's created some chaos, you know, it's, 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 um, but if anything, I think it's, it's really validated the mission that we're on and that's to give, you know, to create a connection between brands and consumers, uh, that's more profitable and more beneficial to the consumer. So, uh, we're, really excited having just come off, uh, you know, one of our, our best quarters ever. Um, you know, we're going to post at least 30% gross revenue growth this year, profitable third quarter. Um, and, you know, and, and with the gross margins where they're at. So again, we're, our, our mission is to ultimately, you know, grow up into a really, you know, subscription based software as a service business model. We're charging recurring licensing fees, um, you know, with meaningful minimum commitments, these brands, you know, pay us for our technology. And, you know, that's what we've been able to achieve this year. 
So, you know, I think you did like 3 million, 3.2 million in the, in the last quarter here in gross margins. I think, you know, it went from 70 to 30. Oh, that's a pretty big leap for you. Um, and uh, so I, I, let's now let's talk about why don't you talk about um, ways, different ways that uh, you and versus competitors solve the problem you're trying to solve here. You know, what are the, and what makes you different than some of the competitors? I mean, when we think about like when, when Ed described what a scenario, you know, you get a pop-up ad on, on your phone and that's something that you do. You're not the only one, only people who do this, right? Um, or try to engage with customers in some way. Um, so what are the different ways that uh, your competitors do that? And why do you do it um, better? Right. Uh, well, first and foremost, we think the battle is on for what we call first party and third party relationships. The difference here is if I have your phone number and you and I can have a conversation, you and I have a direct relationship. If I have your Facebook ID, you and I have a third party relationship. Ultimately, Facebook owns is an intermediary between you and me. And I think that's probably one of the one of the other things that that's a big revelation this year. And, and you've seen it with some of the social unrest and with the, the you know, the with the election and, you know, where everything has gone with social media. There's a lot of mistrust uh, with social media. And there were brands, in fact, this summer brands like Procter and Gamble and Coke that were just boycotting social media. And so I think that, you know, um, number one, the race is on to build direct relationships with customers. And um, so this kind of segues into the competitive conversation. Um, look, there's a lot of ways that a brand can build a direct relationship. They can have a text message conversation with you. They can have, an, they can send you an email. They, you could, you could be a member of their, their smartphone app. These are all ways where they're really not going through any intermediary um, to be in communication with the brand. What we found is that with text messaging, you've got uh, what we what we call like the one, you know, like the the one, you know, I'm sorry, one second. Kind of the one channel strategy, um, you know, so you, you've got, um, they call it the single app strategy, whereas so with smart with with SMS text messaging, there's um, basically you've got forty like fifty. I think it's ninety four percent of text messages are read read within fifteen minutes of receipt. You've got um, the average consumer checking their SMS inbox forty eight times a day. So there's there could be a multitude of reasons or or, or different apps that allow for, that that bring value to the consumer on their smartphone. But at the end of the day, it's text messaging. That's the anchor app. And so you kind of have this one app strategy uh, opportunity by building a direct relationship with your, your consumers through text messaging. So you, we have a 10 year pedigree in text messaging. So while a lot of the marketplace was focused on social media, building smartphone apps, building loyalty programs, we were staying, you know, st sticking with text messaging, the ubiquity of text messaging, um, you know, again, like think about it. If, if you're having a conversation or you're getting an offer or promotion from a brand through text messaging, you don't have to remember a login, a user ID, a password. You don't have to download, understand how to use an app. You have a ubiquitous, consistent interface that's already there. So that's one argument that we make in terms of our competitive advantage because text messaging seems trivial from an end user perspective. But when you have to get X millions of text messages out across Verizon, AT&T, and all these carriers within minutes of lunchtime, that's really hard to do. Plus, text messaging is evolving. So now you can send video, you can send pictures. And with Rich Communication Services, which we had a, a wonderful article written yesterday about our work with, with Inspire Brands and Sonic, um, you can actually put clickable buttons and all, all of the interface that you're used to seeing in an app, you can put inside a text message. So people can click on things, they can buy things, they can pull up maps, and it all feels like a text message. And again, you don't have to log in, there's no user ID and password and so on and so forth. So when we think about our platform, there's two things. Number one is brands don't have the budget to pay for all the channels, email, loyalty, app, text, data, you know, so 
you have to be able to deliver to the brand a one platform strategy. But with any platform, there has to be a killer app. All platforms usually have one app that is the go-to anchor. And our conviction is that's text messaging. And now we have, you know, just like the article that was written about Sonic and Inspire Brands yesterday, we drove like a 50% engagement rate with their app through text messaging. So now text messaging becomes the interface to everything on the mobile phone. And that's a big bet that we've made that we don't know of a competitor that's made that same bet. You have some pure play text messaging platform providers out there that don't have loyalty, don't have email, don't have a uh, receipt, don't have data. And then you have some companies out there that are pure play loyalty companies that might have some data capabilities or receipt or email capabilities. What we've done is we've said, let's, and this is, you know, from our belly acquisition a couple of years ago, let's bring in a competent loyalty solution, competent email, receipt point of sale advertising, data-driven personalization and CRM, and make the tip of the spear text messaging. Great, awesome, awesome. Thanks a lot, Dennis. So what, let's, let's talk about um, more about what you do for your customer. I mean, but, um, we'll actually, well, actually, before we even get to that, I'm curious, um, how do uh, people like me or Ed or anybody here, how do, how, we, how do we find your app? How we how we know that your your product exists? Is it, is it start, are you doing all the marketing? Is is are, are your are your clients that they're, your like restaurants do, engaging with their customers? How's that, how's that happening? How am I getting that app on my phone? Yeah, well, look, I mean, we're we're like um, what is it, 3M? You know, we're we we don't make apps to make them better. You know, so if you use the Subway app, for example, and you open up the Subway app, and there's offers there in your your wallet those offers are powered by Mobivity. If you get an email that says, hey, uh, Maj, guess what? You get, you know, buy one, get one foot long. Uh, either scan this code in your email or open the app. That code in the email is Mobivity. You open the app, that's Mobivity. So what we've done with our platform, again, with our one platform strategy is we've gone back to, okay, let's be the anchor tenant to the customer engagement. So these offers and these promotions are quarterbacked by Mobivity. We know that SMS is the most effective channel, but we would rather live at the hub than the spoke. So SMS is probably the strongest spoke, but um, if you wanted to experience Mobivity for yourselves you know, out in the wild, uh, first and foremost, if you went into any subway, look at the bottom of your seat, it'll say powered by Mobivity. The, literally the printed receipt, order online, order through the, the mobile app, Pick up your pick up your bag of food. There's a receipt, you know, taped to the outside of the bag. Uh, this is powered by Mobivity. Um, but when you go into the app or you open up an email and you see scannable codes or you see a virtual wallet, that's all powered by Mobivity. And so you're basically your your customers are doing a lot of them are, are really push. They basically take your technology, your platform, embed it in their whole infrastructure, and they deal with getting it out their customers out to the the, uh, the consumer, right? Which right. Way? Absolutely. Nice. Okay. Excellent. Um, yes. Uh, Ed, you got anything that, any question? I'm in the monopolizing here. Sorry. So maybe you got some questions. Yeah. Uh, you're yeah. you're a software yeah. guy. So <laughs> I'm yeah. going to run into a wall pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, doing a good job. I think that, um, you know, I think Dennis, it's, it's an important point to be making about that hub and spoke model. And then it's, it's also just the importance of using SMS as kind of the, the, the gateway into a lot of these enterprise relationships. And then, you know, the question is that we've spoken up about before is how, how can you take that and, and work with the enterprise, but then also what does that enable you to do with uh, some of the larger partners that uh, wanna have a, a marketing relationship with the, the end user that you mentioned. And so I thought that's, that's kind of another aspect uh, about uh, if there's a, like a large brand, for example, that maybe wanted to do a promotion in partnership with Subway using Mobivity Maybe you could kind of talk through how, how that works. I think it's a, an aspect of the business that maybe the market doesn't quite fully understand uh, just yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So, you know, we have this mantra at Mobivity, which is land and expand. Um, it, we believe if we can sit at the intersection, if our technology can sit at the intersection between a consumer and a brand, then we can be a participant in all the different ways to monetize in that transaction. So for example, um, we had a program going with Uber for a while, where if you went into any subway in the Southern California market at 
on your on your subway receipt, it, we printed out a unique code that you could type into in the Uber app and get ten dollars off your next ride. So that's an example where Uber was monetizing off of off of subway traffic. So um, we we believe um, that you know there's that's just the beginning. Um, you know, it, right now we're we're helping brands figure out how to get their own customers in more often. Uh, but, but beyond that, the data shows us that like, look, I mean, if you're getting a, a, a text messaging offer from, from, um, from Sonic and, and we know that you're on Verizon, how much would AT&T pay to put a logo on that mobile coupon, uh, or to put a link that, that, that transfers you over. So we've, we've actually done a lot of that, um, a lot of different kind of trial campaigns. We think that that's kind of the next phase of this. And that again, puts mobility kind of in the middle of a interesting marketplace. Um, in addition to that, we did announce, uh, or well, Pepsi announced last year that they had launched this new uh, digital lab initiative. And, um, you know, I think the market doesn't really understand how, how this works, but you know, when you go to restaurants, uh, particularly brands that operate, you know, tens or thousands of locations, they either serve Pepsi or Coke. And that's done by a big, you know, brand level beverage deal. And usually within that deal, the, the, the CPG, whether it's Pepsi or Coke, brings to the table marketing budget. So that, that you know, that, that's to help protect, you know, kind of their drop pricing of, 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 the, of the beverage products or snack products themselves, but it's also to give them a seat at the table. So if, if the brand's going to go out and do a promotion, maybe it's a combo meal, then, you know, they've got money that can buy their way into that combo meal. So that when you see a, hey, number one combo meal, you know, buy a sandwich and get some chips, there's a big Frito bag there or get a drink, there's a big Pepsi, you know, logo there. Um, traditionally, you know, there's just been all of this analog uh, marketing collateral that that's ultimately what they're paying for menu boards, signage in the store, menus, bag stuffers. And, you know, we're in a digital world now. And so this gives the opportunity for Pepsi to help the brands cover their costs for services like ours to do text messaging campaigns, loyalty campaigns, data driven campaigns. And so to your point, again, we're kind of at that intersection and we're really excited about the Pepsi partnership because um, it's just getting off the ground. And, and again, it's, you know, it's a partnership where, you know, they reach half of the marketplace and in, in some cases, or maybe even potentially the majority of cases, you know, we're not even having to burden the brand with the budget to pay for our technology. Maybe Pepsi's paying for it. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of uh, a lot of restaurants, uh, they their first impulse is they say I have a marketing budget and I'm going to go dump it all on Facebook or social media, and a lot of them are finding that hey, I, I know that I spent money, I'm not sure what I necessarily got for it. I mean, there's there's somewhat of a I, I think somewhat of a myth on how how um, helpful a lot of that social media marketing can be. But what I like about what you guys do is you're that you're a different channel, almost a different lane that actually says, hey, we're, this is how, this is the feedback on how um, the campaign that you're running, how it actually worked and how it's been activated. And I think it's a it's a different type of data that because the the restaurant partner is in, has that first party relationship that you mentioned with the customer can't have access to that, that they, they get, so it's a little bit different than with a Facebook type of relationship. Right, and, and, and again, keyword data. You know, we were just working with a major brand, I can't say who it is, uh, just, just today in a meeting where they wanted to know, you know, what, what's, the, what's the difference between curbside pickup and takeout relative to in-store orders uh, and uh, the attachment of their product? You know, how, how much of their product happens uh, to be included in purchases that are in takeout versus delivery versus in-store? so that they can understand better where they should be directing their marketing dollars towards. Um, it's incredible how much untapped potential all that information is right now. You, you're going from a very analog, um, you know, operation in, in so many cases in, in brick and mortar, uh, they're not even set up to execute on the data that they have in front of them. And, you know, we're really helping them do that, but also not just for, for our customers, but for their partners. And to your point, you know, to bring in 
different types of co-promotion or even, you know, uh, cooperative data um, inquiries that will help both, both the brand and their partners sell more. All right, let's talk a little bit maybe next about from, from an investor perspective, what, what's going to get investors excited about, about the company and, and, and the shares. And I think, as you mentioned before, you guys are a SaaS company and working more and more towards that, that SaaS model. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of uh, how many customers you have, average, average deal size, what, um, just all the parameters that kind of go into, into that. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, again, we're, our, our goal is to, to build a software company. So, you know, write, write the product, build the product once, sell it many times. Um, in some cases, that's um, for a premium that might be over a short term relationship. Our, our goal is to build long term relationships, long term contracts, high margins, um, long term subscription, recurring license fees. Uh, we were pretty excited the last you know, a couple of years we've, we've signed, you know, term agreements that have been as much as five years in length. I think when you look at Mobivity and you look at the customers we serve, these are multi-billion dollar operations that are uh, banking a lot of their technical infrastructure on a little company like Mobivity. So, you know, we kind of like to say that we've got the goods there. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, ag again, it's, the, the addressable market, um, I think, is also something that is uh, a, a highlight of, of where we're going. So we've, you know, tra traditionally we've charged a per license or per location fee uh, subscription, an annual subscription rate per location. So that's why we really like franchise brands. Subway operates 44,000 locations globally. You know, to date, we've got deployments in um, the United Arab Emirates, we've got deployments in the UK, we've got deployments in Canada, the United States, Australia. So our software can go anywhere. Um, and we, you know, that I think is, makes, makes our opportunity a global opportunity, um, combined with a subscription recurring revenue model. Uh, we've, we've shown how we can uh, produce very strong gross margins in you know recently 70 percent um and so i think that that's uh and then you just kind of look at just the restaurant category alone like for example in the united states there i think there are about a million rooftops that um you know are restaurants and so when you think about our per location per year subscription fee type, type of model uh that subscription fee multiplied by you know the addressable market has a, a bunch of upside um and um, it's a little bit weighted by our relationship with Subway right now, uh, given their sheer scale. But, you know, we're already deployed in over 40,000 locations. So um, I think that we've been able to punch way above our weight. Um, there's a huge addressable market just in the restaurant space. You know, the, the convenience store space is going to add hundreds of thousands of, of locations as well. Um, we've actually more recently started getting into per consumer subscription fees. So the brand, um, which, you know, I think that when you think about a brand and the number of locations that they have, that's pretty fixed. So uh, outside of our ability to raise our prices, once we hit the number of locations they have, we're kind of stuck as to the maximum subscription fee opportunity that we can garner from, from the relationship. But, but the consumer, the number of consumers can be much higher than that. Um, and, and can definitely just grow with the general population. Um, and so that's one of the things we're also really excited about is some of our customers now have been signing up for consumer based subscription fees where they're paying X per, per consumer per month. And, and, and that's what drives their licensing structure. Um, and I think what we've shown too, is when you kind of look at the ebb and flow of, of our, of our OPEX and you look categorically, you know, you look at, okay. The last couple of years, the company spent a lot of money on engineering research and development. Um, and at the same time has, has continued to serve some very large brands. So on, on, on the one side, you could say, okay, well, you know, there's, there's still some concentration there. There's still, you know, continually doing a lot with Subway and Sonic and some others. But then I'd point back to, well, clearly those brands are spending a lot more money with us. And what we're, we're learning from those brands and we're adding value to the product that we know is going to translate to the rest of the market. And then when you get some of our customers like Sonic getting acquired by Inspire and then Inspire buys Duncan, you know, so then you see, OK, well, you know, now there's consolidation in our, our, our core industry target vertical. 
And now what does that mean in terms of unlocking an accelerated sales rate by way of already having um, customers that are under these, these portfolios? And we're excited about Sonic because, you know, A, um, they are one of the lead dogs this year. And in, in all the brands, you know, I think they've publicly stated they're up 30%, which is unheard of in the restaurant space. Um, so Sonic is, is way up in the middle of a pandemic and they're going, you know, they're going to press as recently as yesterday in touting the success of the digital programs with Mobivity. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And I, you, you touched on the, the headcount and, and R&D and engineering expenses. I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, as a, as a SaaS company, there's some operating leverage that, that you're already getting or you, you definitely can get in the future. So with, with the addition of some of the convenience store type of relationships and, and customers, uh, do you, are you going to have to increase uh, headcount and engineering for that? Or is it, can you really use what you have and, and just kind of grow, grow the, on the sales side? Yeah, we, we've been advocating, you know, for a while now that, look, we're built, we're, we're built for scale. So, you know, there's just so much leverage, we believe, in, in where we can go with our, our business right now. In other words, we've, we've built a lot of product. We've built a lot of infrastructure. We've clearly been able to handle one of the world's largest brands. And I would, I would, I would argue that that's why we were able to then win one of the world's largest convenience store brands proven scale and deployments is a big deal. Um, and we've been saying all along that, you know, this, this operating leverage that we have, in other words, you, you know, uh, uh, revenue growth is not going to be a one-to-one -one increase to OPEX, not even close, you know, with that, that, that software based subscription recurring, you know, high margin business model is going to start um, contributing to our, our net income performance. And we, we believe that's what we've shown this year. Um, our, our cash burn is down dramatically. Our net income swung positive this last quarter. Or so, you know, we've been kind of saying all along that, look, there's, there's a threshold that we're going to cross at some point where we've built this, the infrastructure, we've built the software, and, and now we're just selling it many times. And so new customers are that much more cash accretive. Yeah, I, I had a conversation with someone uh, not, not too long ago about, about SaaS models, and, and they said they had been in a situation when they got into the company where this, the, the SaaS program that they had was hard to sell, hard to set up, and hard to service. And they said, it says, we all know SaaS needs to be easy to sell, easy to set up, and easy to service. And that's always, uh, being in a SaaS business uh, myself, I, I think that's an important kind of uh, lighthouse almost to, to focus on. But we've got a, a quick question from the audience here from Patrick, and then I'll kick it back over to, to Maj. So uh, Pat's question uh, says that while texting is ubiquitous, what are your greatest concerns with regard to people's tendencies, especially in this day and age, to approach third party communi communications with skepticism? So I think he's asking if someone's getting like a like an SMS from uh, a party that they don't know or they're not sure of if they want to uh, respond to. Do you run into any kind of friction points with that or any hesitation that you hear from, from end, end users on, on that type of marketing? No, emphatically no. Um, we have an, an incredible retention rate um, with the programs you run for our customers. And that's because they are all double, in some cases, triple opt-in. And what that means is no consumer gets a message from Subway that they didn't ask for. Uh, and, and so usually the relationship uh, with the consumer is invited uh, by the brand. And, you know, sometimes there's an incentive, you know, get a free six inch sub or get a free combo meal or a free drink or something like that. But it asks the consumer uh, to join. And, and that join process is not easy either. It's, you know, would you like to join reply reply pizza to one, two, three, four, five. And then you reply pizza. And then it replies back and says, are you sure? Reply with your zip code. And then you reply with your zip code. And then it replies back and says, okay, no, we're just triple making sure that, you know, you're okay if we send you three or four special offers as a text message, um, you know, it, it reply yes to confirm. So that's, you know, it's, it's, it's anywhere from a double to triple opt-in. Um, and I would argue that, you know, I, I think that we're in this, it, it, I just remember Facebook and Zuckerberg and everyone testifying a couple of years ago when everyone thought our elections were rigged because of the power of targeted marketing 
And I think that's created a, uh, an awakening. I think it's, it's, it's really um, hit full swing in the recent months where you had brands just flat out boycotting. And, um, you know, where in, in our case, we're building one-to-one relationships between the brand and the consumer that the consumer very explicitly chooses. They know they're entering into an advertising relationship with the brand versus Facebook, where you're tricked into using something that you think is to get, you know, stay in touch with your friends and so on and so forth, but then they're pillaging your data to make sure you get targeted advertising on, on top of all of that. And um, we're, we're already seeing that even with the Gartners and some of the other, you know, I won't, I won't say who specifically, but the industry analysts, they're coming to us and saying, you know, we've seen an uptick of 10X on direct digital platforms like text and email and loyalty because the brands, they're, they're all looking at third-party media and saying, okay, enough is enough. I mean, how, how far do we want to participate in unsolicited, you know, privacy and data, um, you know, breach versus just build a direct relationship with, with the consumer? And when you go back to the, 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 the next generation brands, the Teslas, the Airbnbs, the Amazons, they started, you know, ground up with a one-to-one relationship with with the consumer versus being so heavily reliant on third-party media uh, to advertise um you know their products and services so i think we're in good shape i again i I think that it all comes down to creating an honest connection between the consumer the brand and our our software is designed for that right and just one one quick follow-up on that and i'll let let mosh go and I i think that's it's a key point because it's really um you're the infrastructure that enables all of this to happen and it lets the the brand has the their customers they have their product but you're the infrastructure that kind of connects those those entities together and, and in that hub and spoke model that you mentioned sms would be one one spoke of, of that you mentioned tesla or uh, even things like you know alexa with smart speakers is that something that's kind of in your roadmap and radar like to be able to get direct messaging like into a ways type of application or, or even into a, a tesla dashboard or into a alexa smart smart speaker yeah, it's funny you should ask that. We literally just had a prototype I was working with yesterday for voice. <laughs> uh, it was for a pizza brand. So, um, yeah, you know, look, it, 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 we expect the channels to kind of come and go. You know, text has been tried and true. I think it's hit a level of ubiquity, particularly here in the States. It's not, it's not the same in other countries. You know, in some countries, it's WhatsApp. In other countries, it's, you know, in, in China, it's WeChat. So, the channels can come and go. Um, again, it's really about how do you create an intelligent conversation through that channel? Uh, how do you create offer, you know, redeemable offers and promotions that integrate with the point of sale or the smartphone app or the web ordering? Um, these are all the things that, you know, you can see and experience for yourselves uh, at Subway or Sonic or any of our other customers. Um, it, you know, I think, I, I still think text has a long, I think what we're doing now, what we're seeing in the industry is that, We've, we're now moving to conversation and some of this is being seeded by Alexa, where instead of training consumers to point and click and log in, you just talk or type. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's, that's also very exciting for us. Cause I mean, think about it right now, we're, 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 we're executing, you know, billions of these conversations a year between consumers and brands. Consumers are getting a, Hey, come in today for, uh, free fries with your burger. Well, it's not a leap for us to also just consummate the sale. Reply yes if you want to buy. And you know, we actually built a prototype of this a year ago for Subway. There's a demonstrable. We did this in partnership with Google. Um, it was advertised all over the world where you could, through a text message, you could actually uh, build your sandwich and pick the store you want to pick it up at. And it was all within the text message container, next generation Android Android messaging. So. Um, we expect messaging to evolve. We expect that the, 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 the spokes, so to speak, to evolve. But, um, you know, the other thing too, I'll, I'll just add, you know, this ties kind of back to the, the competitive advantage question, which if, if anyone's, you know, if you study artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, you know, those that are kind of in, this, in the industry know that, you know, the, the real oil there is the data. The more data you have, the smarter your algorithms become. That's where the advantage gets, gets driven from. And, you know, we're now four or five years deep 
into very large retail deployments where we've ingested billions and billions and billions of full basket transaction data, cash, credit, the whole nine yards. And we've been feeding that into machine learning and AI algorithms to train them and, and get them smarter. So I think that's, there's just huge untapped potential there that, um, that, that we're sitting on. All right, great, thanks. I think Maj has a couple more questions. Yep, thanks, Ed. Hey, Nancy, I wanted to touch back really quick on the financials really quick. Um, Ed brought up a point earlier about your operating leverage. If you look at your last quarter, I think um, you had revenues up uh, 3.2 million versus 2.4, 2.5, and your actual um, OPEX was down, um, which was I thought was pretty interesting. So, um, and that, uh, so I, I want to get back a little bit to what Ed was saying there. Um, you know, we saw your actually your R and D was up, which is nice, which you're still spending uh, to improve your improve your I guess technology uh, or make investments into the company, which is nice. Um, your, your sales and marketing was down a little bit. Um, and wondering, um, you know, when we're looking at SaaS companies, solve our companies, you want to, there's always that rule you want to see that marketing budget, you know, kind of stay steady. But maybe it's because the, the nature of your business, maybe it's because your customers actually do a lot of that for you, maybe I'm thinking. So can you talk about, um, you know, how that's going to, how that looks? I and mean, can we, I want to get back to that. How can we, can we expect to continue to see a pretty steady operating uh, expense line or will we see that sort of gradually increase again? Maybe you can explain why the OPEX was down for the quarter. Yeah, no, uh, and that's a really good question. So I think, you know, very simply, the um, the change there was our, you know, our new partnership with Pepsi. And, you know, we looked at that and we said, all right, we've got, you know, the Pepsi Food Service Digital Labs is, is launching. They're picking four partners, uh, one in the discipline of delivery, which is Grubhub. Another in point of sale, which is Toast. If, if you've heard of Toast, they've raised $400 million. And, and they wanted a partner in digital marketing and loyalty, and they picked Mobivity. And we looked at that and we said, okay, you know, they have 400 some odd uh, reps that serve the restaurant marketplace. And those are, those are the reps that are out there helping brands figure out you know, how to sell more Pepsi products, but you know, they take a holistic approach too. Like I said earlier, they're throwing marketing dollars. They're even paying for uh, various things for the brands out in the marketplace uh, for them to, 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 to operate uh, more healthy and, and to grow their business. So when we started to uh, go down the path of partnering with Pepsi, that you know was a pivot for us too. We looked at that and said, look, there's, there's no, I mean, how could you compete with 400 plus direct reps out there? For us, it's really a matter of investing in that relationship, investing in the product, investing in the materials that those reps need to solicit and promote the Mobivity products as a part of the Pepsi offerings. So we, we, we just transitioned from a direct, um, and, and you know, I'd argue that we were just kind of getting into our direct to go to market. And we, we, we drank from the fire hose in 2016 and 2017, launching Subway and, um, and the company doubling basically in that period of time. Um, so about as fast as we kind of started to swing the pendulum through, okay, we're, we're getting lift off from Subway. Now we've got a, a referenceable client and we've got a great product. Let's go after the rest of the restaurant space. And then we walked right into this partnership with Pepsi. And, and, and that partnership has taken about a year and a half. It's taken about 18 months um, to, to, to bring to market. And it's just in the last couple of months. And, and I'll, I'll remind everybody that you know, there was probably a four month COVID timeout. So we would have been to market earlier with Pepsi if, if there wasn't kind of a, a, a pause button hit in the April, May timeframe and everybody getting their bearings straight. But um, I know that just recently in the last couple of weeks, every one of Pepsi's current and prospective customers have received Mobivity marketing material. And, um, and again, back to your question about OPEX, we just thought that, you know, look, we should, we should focus on directing uh, all of our efforts in supporting the Pepsi sales channel versus dumping a bunch of our own OPEX and in, in building a direct channel. And that, can, and that can free up money for your r and I guess, too, right? I mean, I think, I think it, looks, it looks like some of that money might have went into R&D. Um, that was yeah, I mean, we've just learned, and again, I'd point back to our revenue growth, our organic revenue growth. I mean, we've continued to expand the product. We've been able to do more for our customers, um, fortify that hub, one platform strategy, 
And, um, you know, we get criticized sometimes that we have, you know, customer concentration because we have had such big customers. But then I just point back to look at the revenue growth. You know, those customers are clearly spending more money with us. Um, and that's because we're staying in front of the product demand. And, um, you know, we, we don't we don't think we're done there yet. And we think that the digital transformation opportunity again, I mean, once these brands grow up and become you know, where they, where they were, which was, you know, still very heavily analog oriented, you know, marketing, um, you know, types of, of operations to being more digital forward. It's 80% of the economy. Um, you know, there's, there's a long way to go to the upside potential of just how big this market can become. You know, with customer concentration, it's, you know, uh, it, it is definitely a problem for some companies, but in other instances, I think like yours, like a Pepsi, you know, you become part of their whole, you know, their, their whole, their whole engagement, you know, all their customers are going to, you know, are going to potentially use you and, and it becomes a very sticky relationship. It's not just Pepsi, right? It's, 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 it goes further down that whole line. So, um, you know, it really is when you think about it, it, it can be, you can think of it as diversification because and, and, and it becomes a stickier product, I think, for a Pepsi. Absolutely. I mean, just, if you just think about the sheer reach, I mean, a brand can't go out and let's say that, you know, a customer of ours sent out, you know, tens of millions of scannable codes that people could redeem through a text message or in the app. You can't turn, you can't really turn Mobivity off, can you, until that program's run its course, because then you have a bunch of mad, you know, ticked off consumers who are dealing with tech that doesn't work. So the stickiness factors, you know, we really become a strategic partner. And that's something that, you know, we're really excited about. And, and that doesn't change fast. So I think that brings stability. I think it brings revenue clarity. I think the quality of revenue, uh, uh, you know, that, that our business model uh, provides is very high. Um, you know, we've been working with Subway since 2015. We've been working with Sonic since 2012. Um, so I think we've done a really good job of pioneering uh, this market for some very big customers. And and this year has been where the, you know, we believe kind of the inflection point has started to develop where we're now transitioning to the broader marketplace. And with, with all that's going on with COVID, you know, you want low touch, no touch, all these use cases now that weren't there before are top of mind. Like, you know, how do you inform consumers that their to-go order is ready? How do you market to that consumer if they're getting third-party delivery? You know, they got that food delivered by Grubhub, but how does, how does you know, Sonic get a message to the consumer. All that receipt all of a sudden becomes really valuable real estate. Um, when consumers are watching less and less TV advertising, I just seen, I just read the study yesterday where, I mean, everybody knows streaming uh, video uh, consumption's way up, um, but it's it's just become heavily slanted to platforms like Netflix and other very low to no commercial and advertising platforms. And so, um, you know, TV advertising exposure is way down and these brands have to very quickly figure out how do I keep a persistent connection to market to and communicate to the, to the consumers given all of this change in behavior. And before they could kind of play around with things, experiment, do trials, you know, now, it, you know, it's an extinction level event. Excellent. And my, my last question, Dennis, you know, and we touched upon this, and I think for, um, I did in, in the original Grapevine um, series you did for, uh, for Grapevine. Um, you know, you've raised some money in the past and you had, you, which, which you had to, obviously, uh, to get this thing going. Um, you're, you're making money now. It seems like you've reached a situation where you're, as you grow revenues, you're going to become, you know, profitable at a, a quicker rate than your revenues are growing because of the leverage. Um, do you think you'll have, are you in a position now where you can at least grow a, a, a respectable rate without having to raise money in the markets? Um, I know you, I don't want you to give guidance at all. And, and, and there'll never be a situation where you'll say you can't raise money or won't raise money. But there was one point where it was probably you had to do it. <laughs> and, and now, what, what, where are you now in that kind of thinking? Yeah, I mean, look, last year, I think we burned like 3.7, 3.8 million of cash. And, and through the first nine months of this year, we've burned 500,000. And when you look at our debt on the balance sheet, you could probably figure out that a lot of that was just, you know, servicing some of that debt. So, um, you know, we felt all along that we'd get to a certain threshold where the, the, um, the revenue and the OPEX would cross where, you know, we're, we're essentially self-sustainable. Um, yeah, no, I mean, look, again, we're, 
we're, we're pretty proud of posting a profitable quarter. Uh, we've, we've done a, I think a great job of managing cash this year. We feel like this is, you know, we're in sales mode. Uh, we can sell a lot more of our products and services without adding headcount and, you know, material operational investments. Uh, we've, we've been doing that deliberately, you know, that money was spent over the last three or four years, um, trying to be ahead of the market, getting ready for this type of situation. Uh, again, I, I always have to make sure I, I clarify, I wouldn't have expected this type of environment to be the instigator. Um, but, uh, you know, we are where we are. And, um, you know, unless there's something very interesting that makes sense from a cap structure, you know, inorganic growth opportunity, you know, we're, we feel very good about the, the organic situation, you know, with the company, you know, we're not, in other words, you know, we were over investing in product, we were um, spending on growth in the past. And um, now with with the revenues that we're enjoying from our customers and the improvement in margins, you know, we're not anywhere near where we were in terms of relying on, um, you know, investor capital to, to sustain uh, the, the, op, the OPEX. Um, so I know it's a long winded answer, but you know, look in short, no, uh, we, we just posted a profitable quarter. We've said all year long that, you know, our goal given the chaos and the dynamics of the marketplace, it's look, fortify the company, but also prove that we can we can get new very big relationships. So that's why we're so excited about this convenience store chain that we um, that we just announced a few days ago. Um, and, and look, they're betting on us too. You know, these these, these multi billion dollar brands don't don't look at the balance sheets of their key vendors and and sign big contracts uh, if they feel that you know the company's not financially viable. So. Um, you know, again, I just uh, I think that there's there's a lot of upside to be had with the company. We'll be prudent in how we do that, um, but we're just you know we're content now with where we've gotten to in terms of our our operating income level. Excellent. Well, let's uh, have a lot more to discuss. Maybe some uh, some other point, uh, Dennis. Or, you know, I'm glad you went through some of the most important points that I was interested in today. So, uh, with that, I'll throw it to Ed. Yeah, Dennis, uh, thanks again. Um, I guess before we uh, wrap up here, is there anything, any closing comment that you wanted to make or anything you think is important for the, the investor community to know that maybe we didn't get to, to ask today? No, I look, I think this was a great session. I appreciate all the all the questions. I think we covered a lot of bases. Um, you know, look, I, I we've, we've said all along that we felt that, you know, that Brick and mortar obviously transcends a lot of everyday activities from eating food to, you know, going to the grocery store, getting your hair cut, getting your oil changed and so on and so forth. And um, this, this breakthrough into the convenience store space uh, is just uh, another step towards a horizontal business model. Um, and so I just want to remind everybody, when you think about what we've, what we've commented on in terms of the size of the restaurant industry, you know, again, it's it's multiples uh, of that size when you start getting into these other verticals, and hopefully, uh, you know, there's an appreciation there in recognizing the convenience store breakthrough that we've had. Um, and you know, we expect that as we move into these other verticals too, it's you know, the product is is majoritively built. You know, there's always going to be some new add-ons and some evolution there, but. Uh, we spent a lot of time building a product that serves the brands that we've worked with in the restaurant space. And this convenience store win, I think, is big validation that that same product can have a, a lot of impact in some very meaningful industries horizontally. So, um, just, you know, I, I'd say that we think that there's more to come there um, over the next, you know, say three to six months with, with other wins. And we look forward to keeping everybody, you know, posted on our progress. Yeah, great. And I, and I hope everybody uh, listening on the call, I want to, want to thank you for joining, but I hope hope you kind of catch that because I've noticed it's a theme with with Dennis and with Mobivity is uh, just execution. I think if I had to su sum everything up in one word. So uh, we've talked about some things in the past on previous calls and, and now we're getting to hear the update and seeing the, the fruit of that uh, today. And we'll look forward in the, the next uh, you know several quarters to get an update on the convenience store uh, aspect of the business. I think as the restaurant business kind of has its ups and downs with the uh, closings, reopenings, closings, reopenings with, with Corona, it's a nice kind of adjacent uh, business uh, to, to kind of try to penetrate with the convenience store. So be excited to hear how that goes in the future. 
All right. Well, Dennis, thank you again for your time today. Uh, if anybody has any questions that they didn't get to ask in the chat, please feel free to, to email us at questions at littlegrapevine.com. Um, Maj, uh, thank you again for your time today. And pl please do check out GeoInvesting. And, and if you're interested in more of Maj's research and uh, kind of more analysis on companies like Mobivity. But other than that, um, we will see you all again soon and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And Dennis, uh, thank you again. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.